Good afternoon. Welcome to the Food Enthusiast. I'm Dara Banjan here at Jay Moore Living. Some of you have watched the show before. I now officially have the backdrop and we've sort of switched rooms in the house. I'm in the office. And um, if this is your first time tuning in, I am a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. And at the top of the show, I'd like to remind people that they can go back into the archives and watch many, many of the previous shows, either on the Facebook page for Jaymore or jaymoreliving.com. Take them for your walks, take them in your runs, doing a drive, you know, just listen. They're great interviews. Today, what can I say? The queen of it live, the queen of interviews, Chef TV star Sarah Moulton, star of series Sarah's Weeknight Meals. She's a cast on Chris Kimball's uh, Milk Street podcast and radio. Her cookbook, Home Cooking 101. And let's bring Sarah in. Hey, Dara. Hi, Sarah. I'm so happy to have you here. You are the consummate interviewer teacher i adore you you know i just you're great and i so thrilled to have you here um you just wrapped up filming your 10th season of sarah's weeknight meals tell us about it how was filming under covid and what can we look forward to well, it's going to start airing in October, uh, early-ish October, and uh, it was sort of a miracle. We were supposed to shoot season 10 last year, but, you know, it was impossible. And also, our major sponsor is Cruise Line, so they were a little tied up with some problems. Uh, I mean, they weren't any of the cruise lines that, you know, had people on ship for a million days all infected. But at any rate, finally, we um, managed to get it all together and we shot in a week, which is pretty intense. But with public television, that's sort of what you got to do. And we shot it at my producer partner's house. A little secret that's not a real secret is we pretend it's my house. It's in the country. Well, it's in the burbs. And she just got a beautiful garden. She used to have a dog. I pretended it was my dog. <laughs> Occasionally I'd slip and say, oh, I wish I had that in my kitchen because I'm in New York City. My kitchen is essentially sort of a galley kitchen. It's very nice, but it's you couldn't shoot there. And it's so much nicer to shoot out there. So we shot out there with several young people who were fantastic. I love working with these young people with fire in their bellies. We had three culinary um, women, uh, two, two interns and one you know culinary professional and a great camera guy. We only had one camera guy. He was like hanging from the ceilings to get the right <laughs> pictures. And we shot uh, several new episodes. I had a few new guests, Aris Johnson, um, a mate who's from uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, and she made a, an authentic jambalaya. And Grace Young, um, cookbook author, and she did a, some wonderful, this wonderful barbecue pork thingy. And then we did something we call Ask Sarah, which is where somebody, right. it's like my cooking live show, where somebody calls in with a, well, they, they Skype, well, I did we Zoom in? I guess we did Zoom, Zoomed in, and we had a conversation. Although I knew the question in advance, so it was more detailed. You know, like, for example, what thickeners do you use? So we, we you know, discuss thorny issues in this yeah. short amount of time. At any rate, it's airing in the fall. I'm real happy about it. And I hope everybody checks it, checks it out. It's, you can find out where it airs in your neck of the woods by going to the website, sarahmolton.com. And there's a little button you hit that will tell you when and where it airs in your neighborhood. I'm just sitting here watching and trying to get this, the new computer set up. So you see me turning that's fine. I can't find my mouse thing. I had to do something. Where are you? Okay, so let me get back to you. There we go. There we go. Come on. Okay, that's as far as it's gotten. Um, we already have people checking in. Chef Nancy Longo, Jeannie Siegel, Jeffrey Spear. They're all sending regards. Nice. 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 Um, you know, to do to do a series in a week, I did that. One time I filled in last minute for Stephen Reichland down in Tubac. My wow. girlfriend was a producer. His assistant got sick. 
will you come in and be a PA? I said, well, I've never done it, but I'll give it a shot. And um, so, yeah, a week filming at night. I, it's, but let's talk about your experience in shooting things like this. You did Sarah Moulton live on the Food Network. You did what, 1,400, 1,600 shows? 1,500. 1, not all not all of the live call-in show. 1,200 live call-in show, 300 of the, <clears throat> we had a, you know, taped show, um, live to tape, you know, that, but that wasn't live, live. People don't understand what live means. There's a live audience. There's a live to tape, meaning you just try to do it and you record it, but you don't air it at the same time as you're recording it. And right. then there's live live, like all the newscasts are that we see uh, for who, anybody who still watches the news on TV in the morning or in the evening. That's live live. Good Morning America, where I worked for 20 years, 10 behind the scenes and 10 in front of the camera. That's live live, meaning it's what you see is what's happening. And so was cooking live. And we took calls from people. So it was a scary proposition and we had no time delay. So we got a few nutcases. Um, <laughs> we actually had six in six years, and we cut them off pretty quickly, but not before they said something inappropriate or dirty or whatever. Well, that's when I became aware of you. And Tom and I would sit. Dinner was always with Sarah at 7 o'clock. Nice. And then you started doing prime time cooking live. You'd have guests, you take questions. And uh, in this period of time, you were working for Gourmet Magazine as their chef. And one time, I don't know where we were, a lunch or dinner, and you told me what your day consisted of. From getting up in the morning, you had two young children at that time. Can you tell people a rundown of a day doing two shows? It was pretty bananas, but I knew at the very beginning, the recent, so I had Cooking Live, which aired from seven to eight on the East Coast, and Cooking Live Primetime, which aired from 10 to 11. So uh, I was told the reason they did the second show right. is they were going to give it a year and see, because they needed to bump up Primetime. Primetime was weak, and they thought this kind of variety show might work you know, having different guests on, but they said, we're going to give it a year and, and then we'll decide which one of the shows we keep. Uh, now, unfortunately that put a lot of pressure on the team on the seven o'clock team. They're like, Oh, great. You know, we've launched you, you've done this show. Now you might leave. I mean, I had no say over it anyway, but when you know that there's a limit to something you have to do, meaning a limited amount of time, it's so much easier to do it than if it's, it's an indefinite amount of time. So I said to myself, you can do this. You really can. It's only for a year. As it turns out, it only was nine months. But because then they made a choice and they chose just to keep the seven o'clock show, which I was glad about. I did not enjoy doing the 10 o'clock show. But a typical day would be um, dropping the kids off at school. A actually, the Food Network gave me a car and a driver. Um, I had actually... Three was it the green green limo? Why do it I was, think it's a big blue Cadillac? That was the name oh. of it was a gentleman who had a company called Big Blue Cadillac, and he had exactly one big blue Cadillac. Um, <laughs> and he was very entertaining. He was Jamaican. He had dreads down his back, and he's a lot of fun. Um, but at any rate, the Food Network gave that to me to make this work. So I'd go to Gourmet and work until two. I got a job, somebody to do my job in the afternoon. Uh, we did lunches, so this really did work. And Gourmet was okay with it because I was the executive chef of Gourmet Magazine. That's how I, I was identified on the Food Network. So that's good PR. But anyway, so the guy would pick me up at Gourmet at two o'clock drive me out to Brooklyn to pick up the kids who went to school in Brooklyn. And the kids love that. You know, this is very classy, a big blue Cadillac and this guy, the Jamaican guy in dreads. And, you know, we get picked up and dri dr uh, driven back to my house in Chelsea. And then I'd hang out with the kids for a little while and then I'd go to the Food Network at five uh, to get a lifetime supply of makeup for both shows. And I would review both shows uh, with my two different producers and then I would do this, this seven o'clock show from seven to eight. And then my driver would 
take me home. We had dinner. Um, cause my, I said to them, this is one prerequisite, you know, I want to spend time with the kids in the afternoon, but we also, we have family dinner. That is our religion. So he would drive me home. I'd get home around eight 15, um, and stay for an hour. Um, how dinner miraculously happened was I hired this wonderful woman I worked with at Gourmet to be my housekeeper, Magda Alcayaga. And, uh, she, she was fantastic and the kids adored her uh at any rate she would she was a very good cook too so she would make set up dinner and i'd finish it or the husband would finish it we'd sit down we'd have dinner 8 15 i'd go back to get ready at 9 15 excuse me he'd pick me up we'd go back i'd get ready to do the 10 o'clock show i'd do the show from 10 to 11 and then this guy the driver would bring me home so i did that it was only five nights a week although plenty of nights a week that was crazy and um it was pretty grueling. It was a lot of information. I had a lot of guests on the 10 o'clock show. So I had to do crunch a ton of homework in the car to learn who the heck these people were so I could ask them appropriate questions. Uh, I, I used to love it because, you know, when we meet each other, it's always a question, who's taller than who? Oh, everybody and, was taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, on the show, but you and I are pretty much around the same correct, height. Correct. But you're much slimmer. Oh, I don't know about that, particularly not after the last year. Do you do any exercise? I walk, oh God, about at least an hour a day. And I should do more. I've recently realized, come on, you got to do some sit-ups and some weightlifting, particularly as we get older, us ladies, we really must. So I'm trying to add that to the routine. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, mainly it's walking. I just, it gives me great pleasure. New York's such a great city to walk around. And you're a New York girl. You were raised in New York City, weren't I was. You? Yes, I was. And um, I, I want to jump to something because most people know that you were a protege of Julia Childs and how you got on the show. She sent you to France. Yes. Right. To... Um, um, stagiaire with um, some French chef. But we're going back to, what, the 80s at that time? 1979. 1979. No, and, yeah, you're 79. It was 79, right. Okay. So the harassment that women have gone through in kitchens um, still exists today, maybe not in the same level, but I remember you telling me a story about a French chef and something and a hotel room and a raincoat, just pieces stick. Can you fill people in on that story? Oh God. Well, so here's the thing. I was a chef of a restaurant at the time I went over to do this apprenticeship. It was a three month gig and um, I was very excited. It was a one star restaurant, Chart France. And so I went over and it became apparent right off the bat that the executive chef, the guy who was a friend of Julia's who'd given me this opportunity, was not gonna let me work the line. And that was deeply insulting to me, um, but I figured, okay, I'll make the best of it. I'll just, you know, I got to learn all the recipes and work behind the scenes on all the stations. And, but then it became apparent also that he was a bit of a lascivious, lascivious dirty old man um, I mean, he, I guess, other, you know, that was sort of the culture. Uh, a lot of French men uh, do mess around. I mean, I was working with his wife and his daughters. So it's not exactly like I could complain to them. But at any rate, he, we, we worked a split shift um, Monday through Saturday. And then on Sunday, we only worked lunch. And then Sunday afternoon and Monday, we were off. And so the first two weeks, Sunday, Mondays, he invited me to do something with him. The first Monday, I, I had my now, she's now my sister-in-law with me. She'd gone over to France with me and then she was going to go on. And he took us to some chateau and that was fun. The second Sunday, Monday, he said, okay, we're going to go to the Palace Elysee, which is the equivalent of the White House in Paris. And because uh, an old apprentice was the sous chef. So um, we drove on Sunday afternoon. I already knew that he was a bit of a problem because he'd already started asking me questions in the wine cellar about my boyfriend. 
and what kind of birth control do you use? I mean, questions nobody should be asking you. And so we get to this hotel and it's called the Hotel California, not even the Hotel California. It's on the Champs-Élysées. And apparently it's where all the cuisiniers stay, where all the cooks stay. So I was like, well, okay. But then he gets us one room. And I was like, oh no, here we go. So we go upstairs and thank God, it's two single beds and two bathrooms. I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can do this. So then we go out to dinner and he knew everybody. He was a maitre cuisinier de France. So I pronounced that terribly. My French has gotten rusty, but he knew everybody. He worked with Ferdinand Plant. I mean, it was crazy. And no, where does he take me? He takes me to Folly Berger, which for <laughs> anybody who doesn't know is a topless dancing dinner place. <laughs> And I think he literally thought it would be titillating. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But I, so he started telling me how Frenchmen are such wonderful lovers. And we have to pause for a second. And this is sort of unfair. But I mean, hey, I was young. He was short, fat, bald, and ugly. It would have made a difference if he was young and attractive. I don't know. Maybe I would have thought, well, what, what the heck? Let's have a it's fling. Paris. But, yeah, why not? It's a different time. Hoo -hoo. You know, I wasn't married or anything. I mean, I did have a boyfriend. But... He was short, fat, bald, and ugly. So at any rate, he started telling me about what great lovers Frenchmen were. And I started, I purposely misunderstood him. I mean, pretended to and asked him about Ferdinand Plant and other things. So we got through dinner. It was really dreadful food. I was so bummed out. And then we get back to the hotel. And it's the moment of truth. And he told me that normally he, normally he slept très nu, meaning very naked. But for me, he would wear his pyjama. So he went in his bathroom and put on his pyjama. And I went into my bathroom and put on my pyjama and my raincoat and my belt. And we each got into our single beds and I made it through the night. He didn't lay a hand on me. I guess I gave him a message and I didn't sleep at all. And then the next morning we got up, we went and had champagne with the sous chef at the Palais Elysee and drove back. And that was, I never went anywhere with him again. And it, it took me six months to tell Julia. I mean, and I stuck it out. I stuck it out because I really learned a ton. Those European chefs know how to not waste food. So my food cost when I came back at my restaurant was so much better. Uh, but also I just learned a ton about ingredients and preparation and recipes and stuff that I use to this day. So it was worth it. But it took me six months to tell Julia that part of the story. And when I finally told her, you know, the guy hit on me and he was disrespectful and blah, blah, blah. She said, oh, dearie, what'd you expect? They're all like that. Get over it. <laughs> now, I don't think in this day and age she would say that. You know, the, the whole dialogue has changed here. It's, it, it really wasn't appropriate. I told that story gleefully to a bunch of human resources people at a you know, conference. And they, of course, were all like, ah, you know, that's, that can't happen. That's so wrong, you know, so. Right. But so I survived. Right. Back to what was 1982. You co-founded the New York Women's Culinary Alliance. Right. Which exists today. Right. Tell us the story, the formation of it, and how it has grown and what it's doing today. Well, what happened was I moved to, I'd been in Boston working in restaurants after cooking school. I went to the CIA and then I worked in Boston. And then the now husband said, I want to move to New York and I want you to come and let's get married. I couldn't leave right away. Uh, I had to finish up the job I had, but then I moved to New York in 81. And because I'd worked with Julia and we had such a nice relationship, she gave me an introduction to all, I said to her, I want to go work at a really great restaurant because I've been working at good restaurants in Boston, but I was always sort of the boss. You know, I come right out of cooking school and I wanted to go look from, learn from some great master. So right. she gave me introductions to all the restaurants in New York, the really good ones, the top notch ones. Right. The trouble was they were all helmed uh, by European males. And although they were très charmant and would have an interview with me, they wouldn't hire me. No way. I was a mere female. I finally um, landed a job with a, a very talented woman, Sally Dar, and that's the job I took at La Tulipa. It was a great restaurant. It was a three-star in New York Times, and I learned a ton there. But as a result of that experience, I was just like, this is wrong. 
we'd done a similar thing in Boston with Julia. We'd formed a group called the Boston Women's Culinary Guild, sort of an all gals club to combat the all boys club, which there are many in the culinary world, or at least enough that keep women out. So I thought, well, this would be a way to combat that kind of thing that I'd experienced. And my original idea was to have it all be chefs, but I found out rapidly that chefs don't have a lot of time to be a member of a group. So we opened it up to everybody. And so we had food editors and wine writers and PR people and food stylists. And it ended up being really great to have that mix because a lot of us would need somebody else from somewhere else, you know, like a wine expert to come in and do an event at Gourmet or a food stylist. I actually was chef of the executive dining room at Gourmet and we'd have clients. And so I'd hire somebody from the group to make a, a chocolate bag in the shape of a cocoa, uh, you know, co not whatever, a Chanel not Coco Chanel, Chanel bag. a Chanel bag, not Coco Chanel, Chanel bag. So it was really great. And so we, we've, you know, existed throughout the years, you know, fluctuating between a hundred to 200 members. And then we had a serious bump last year, as many organizations did, as many organizations must. And those who haven't, I don't trust. Um, we had a Black Lives Matter meltdown. Um, we had an African-American president and she, this is in the middle of the COVID, um, she wrote uh, an email to the whole group saying that she was effectively resigning that moment because she was so sick to death, essentially of the racist bullshit that was going on in the group. She brought in a hundred new members, all women of color and mostly chefs, which I was delighted about. So finally, we're getting chefs back in, right? But apparently it wasn't such a welcome situation. So my first reaction as the founder, I was no longer a president or on the board or anything. I went into my husband and I said, oh boy, this thing has happened. This is really awful. The things she said that she experienced were really awful. I think the group just has to go bye-bye because why would anybody want to be a member of this group? And why would any of these new members that she brought in want to stay? And he said, really? really? You're going to let this group fold, this one that you started in 1982 for a good reason? Really? So I, I said, oh, hmm. So I went and I, it was like unraveling a murder mystery. I talked to all the players, meaning all the board members, because there was obviously a lot of issues there. And I talked to our lawyer, who everybody liked, a male, a man actually, but he, he's, he works for us pro bono, great guy. And he said, um, here's what you need to do. You need to put together a task force and revamp the bylaws and elect a new board and, you know, address all the issues. So that is what we did. But before we did that, we hired an absolutely fantastic woman, April Francis, an equity consultant to advise the process and she was just so amazing and so that's what we did we got together a task force um, a very diverse task force with a, quite a few of the younger new members and um, we revamped the group completely and um, new, new bylaws new code of ethics which everybody must sign we did diversity training we have a new board uh, we have new executive executives. So it's fresh, fresh, fresh. One of the things that was an issue besides the, the racial issue, issues, the, the equity issues was also this thing that I think is very real, which is um, old guard, new guard, you know, a resistance uh, on right. our part, the older members to listen to the younger members about how the world had changed in every way, in every way. So that sort of got in the way sometimes. And we're still a work in progress. There are still issues. Um, but I feel currently, I am feeling very, very hopeful. We've got a wonderful uh, top three executives and um, they're so clear in what they're doing, they're focused now. Every president has a different focus, but their focus is uh, to help our members to forward their careers. It's always been about networking and education, but this is even more targeted, you know, through social media, through doing events, through, uh, yeah, promoting what our members do. And I, I think it's gonna be great. You know, here in Baltimore, 
Um, well, there's two people ways back on Instagram and through Women Chef and Restaurateurs, which came a little after you setting up the uh, New York Women's Culinary Alliance. Right. Right. Um, I met um, El Simone, who um, did a lot of food styling for the Food Network, and she has she chef. She's a black chef. And locally here in Baltimore, we have one, Just Call Me Chef. And it's yes, really, I've heard of that one. Yes, she does a calendar. Um, she's fabulous. I, you know, she's one of these people. You know, she had the small infant. She's doing this. They just bought a building um, that they're doing to bring in and help uh, women of color and give them kitchens and things to work. So um, it's a real groundswell, and it should be. Yeah. And no, it should I mean, be. If I hear from an organization that's not gone through an adjustment, a major adjustment, I'm like, that's that's wrong. It, it's, it's It's really pervasive. It really needs to be dealt with in all organizations, you know, that are more traditional, old-fashioned, whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, the world as is right now is changing for many reasons between COVID, between all the things that are happening. And yes, all lives matter, black lives matter. You know, we went through a terrible time politically. Hopefully we're on to a better time. Now I'm going to switch to a question. You'll love this one. It says, were it not for Julia, where do you think you would be today? That is such an amazingly good question because I frankly don't know. I mean, you know, people are like, oh, look at all you've done. And I was like, well, yeah, because I had this woman who opened all the doors for me. Um, I mean, I'm a plenty hard worker and certainly ambitious enough, but I really don't know what would have happened. I really don't. It's, uh, it's because of Julia that I got a job at a really great restaurant in New York. And um, because of Julia, I worked at Good Morning America behind the scenes. And because of that, the Food Network approached me to work at the Food Network. So everything really came from Julia. So I probably would have had a good job. I probably would have stayed in restaurants a while longer just because I wouldn't have gotten next to gourmet the way I did. I, I don't really know. I mean, it's sort of sad to think what would have happened. I don't know. You know, Things are put before us. We never know what path we're going to take. Uh, me meeting you, you were my idol. I watched you every night. And there was a big gourmet show here in Baltimore to tell people how we connected. And um, the person running it said, well, I'm going to get the culinary students to do the prep. I said, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'll do this for free. I brought in friends, Ellie Wang. And I remember before we all went out to dinner that night, you pulled me up on stage. I was like, ah. <laughs> um, we, we stopped at Soda Sopa restaurant and the three of us were sitting and having drinks and Ellie Wang is telling you about gefilte fish. I think it was a gefilte fish loaf or something. Yeah. And um, that's folks, that's how we met. And our paths have crossed at different times. Many I times. Always Always see Sarah at the fancy food show where I will be up there. Very sad. At least it, it's one floor this year. I'll be popping through. And let's see. So I have some typical questions I ask. Best or worst piece of advice or either or that you've received? Doesn't have to be from Julia. It is from Julia. Um, I can't help it. You know, uh, it's about home cooks it's for home cooks it's um never apologize never explain uh, when you have people over for dinner they're so glad you cooked and they didn't don't tell them what's wrong with the dish you know with the chicken saute you know that it needed more acid or you should have reduced the sauce or whatever it, it's just presented as if it's the best chicken dish you've ever made and it really, I have to remind myself almost every single time I entertain, which I don't do all that often because I don't like to entertain, <laughs> but uh, I have to remind myself of it. So don't be so uptight about it. Just as Julie would say, just have fun. Have fun. Right. I remember one time 
I attempted baking is not is a chore for me. It's a challenge, and I'm not good at it. But I was making an apple tartan, mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't caramelize. So I just took bowls, ice cream, chopped it up, and put it on there and served it. But I had really wanted that presentation, that look. But they didn't know. So, yes, of course. And I agree with you. If somebody cooks for them, they're very happy. And most chefs do not eat gourmet every night. No. Um, I used to run cooking classes in the restaurants here in Baltimore, and I would have the chefs over for dinner. And nobody ever cooked for the chefs. And wow. If they, if they were Italian, I, yeah. yeah. If they were Italian, I cooked Asian. If they were Asian, I cooked Italian. I just didn't cook in their cuisine. Of course. They were very, very happy. Um, you, I want to tell people, anything you want to reach Sarah, just sarahmolton.com, everything we've talked about the um, New York Women's Culinary Alliance, Milk Street, all these links are there. Sarah's on Facebook, Sarah's on Twitter. She's everywhere. So if you know how to spell Molten, you can find her. Um, you did uh, something for your alma mater, University of Michigan, um, Maisie Grace. Is that what you call it? Maze Grays. Maze, Maze. Is, Maze is one of our colors, blue and yellow are the University of Michigan colors. So it's Maze Grays is the title they gave it. Yeah. It was a quarterly column. Right. So you talked about it's the season where people are going to start canning tomatoes. And I thought this idea was fabulous that if you're blanching your tomatoes, the technique to how to blanch, but to save the skins. And then just bake them off and grind them up into a tomato powder. Wow. Right. right. Well, you know, I think there's been, I mean, a national movement to stop wasting so much food. And um, people throw out all sorts of things, parts of vegetables that they don't need to. I mean, it's you have to be very careful with vegetables because sometimes one part of them is completely edible, but yet another part of them is, is poisonous. So you just have to check. Obviously, we know that tomato skins are not poisonous, but I think it's always great when you can repurpose yet another part of a vegetable that you used to throw out, you know, like carrot tops or beet greens, or, I mean, people have been eating beet greens, but yeah. I'm just checking my notes here. Um, let's talk a little bit about Home Cook 101. I remember, we were, I think part of the theme of that was don't, waste time ahead of time doing all your mise en place, having everything in front of you. Why don't you explain that to people? I understand it, but. Wow. I mean, that was a very heretical thing for me to do because no chef in their right mind would ever start cooking anywhere without having everything prepped ahead of time. And uh, what I realized, because I was trained as a professional chef and worked in restaurants for seven years, is then I pivoted when I went to Gourmet, although I ran the executive dining room, it was only maximum 16 people, it was peanuts, right? But I still had to make dinner at home every night. So I started thinking like home cooks, how the heck do I come home at 5.36 and get dinner on the table in a timely fashion when you have homework and other things to do? And so I started looking for short cuts. As I mentioned before, Family dinner is our religion, so we have it every night, and we did from when the kids were tiny. Um, and I realized, wait a second, I, I started looking at how I cook. So let's say you're making a meat sauce. Everybody knows the first thing you do, or pasta with meat sauce, the first thing you do is you put the pot of water on. Okay, fine, everybody knows that. You put the pot of water on before you do anything else and get it boiling. And then I noticed here's far more efficient way to go instead of chopping, dicing, slicing everything. While the water is coming to a boil, chop the onion, mince the onion, right? Heat up the oil while you mince the onion. Then add the onion to the oil and soften it. While it's softening, mince the garlic, okay? Then you add the garlic to the onions. And then while that's still finishing cooking, don't burn the garlic, don't even let it get golden, pull it off if it gets too dark. You can take the tomatoes, let's say you're using, or, well, I forgot there's ground beef in there. You can get the ground beef out and you can add it to the uh, onions and garlic. And then while that's, you know, getting, losing its color and cooking, by the way, the best tool to stir it is a potato masher. 
to get it all broken up. I discovered that recently. Okay. Um, you open up your can of tomatoes and sque- either throw it in a bowl and squish it up with your hands or cut it with scissors or whatever you want to do. Don't cut it on a cutting board because you will be chasing the liquid. And then you throw it in. <laughs> so the point being here that if I done chop the onion, mince the garlic, chop the tomatoes um, all ahead of time or grated the Parmesan cheese. I mean, now when it's simmering, I'm going to be grating the Parmesan cheese. I would have lost 20 minutes at least. But instead of, I'm now taking advantage of cooking time to do the next thing. So my idea of mise en place these days is to take everything out of the refrigerator and throw it on the counter and then look at it and think about what's first, what's second, what's third. There is one very notable exception, and that is Chinese cuisine. If you're doing a stir fry, you have to have every last ingredient minced, diced, sliced, measured, because everything only spends about 30 seconds in the pan. Uh, so you burn it up if you didn't have it already. That's my only exception to the rule. I think you can't be a novice cook to do what I just suggested, but the more you cook, the more, more you'll figure out how to use the idea I just laid out, which is to not chop, dice, slice everything. Just get it on the counter so it's handy. Um, a lot of comments coming in here. I find Indian cuisine to be similar to Chinese. Well, there, I agree in that there's so many uh, wonderful spices involved with Indian cuisine. So you, you really, it's not like just, eh, I'll add some oregano. I mean, there's many, many spices. So yeah, you sort of want to have that ready. In my experience, it's not necessarily fast cooking uh, Indian cuisine the way Chinese is. And there's so right. many different kinds of Indian, just there's so, as there's so many different kinds of Chinese. There's no one. It's all regional. But um you know, yeah, it'd probably be a good idea to have those ingredients measured because there's so many of them and you have to add them at the right time. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. I can talk to you forever and uh, I have no idea what's on your plate today. Forgive the pun, but I thank <laughs> you for making time. A couple questions I ask at the end. What would you say was your most epic culinary fail? Oh my God, are you ready for this one? It was when I was working at the La Tulipe, the restaurant that I finally got a job at in New York City with Sally Dar. And I was right. the um, chef tournant, substitute cook. And so that means I did a different job every night and everybody got a second day off. And so I learned every station. On Sunday nights, I was the chef de cuisine. And so I was the main person on the line. And who should come for dinner? Who lived a block away but James Beard? He was a good friend of Sally Dar's. <laughs> and he ordered rack of lamb. I was such a nervous wreck. So rack of lamb was the, bro- the broiler station. I was such a nervous wreck. I threw three different ones on. I knew Sally wouldn't mind if I wasted a few ingredients. Somehow I managed to overcook all three. And uh, Sally would not let anything go out of the kitchen unless it was perfect, especially if it was somebody like for, for James Beard. So she threw him an extra course to buy us more time. And I put on a fourth rack of lamb and finally managed to calm down, breathe in, breathe out and cook it properly. So it was rare, medium rare, but that was humiliating. And to this, he doesn't know, but I know. And Sally knew that was awful. And you live to tell about it. (laughs) I'm still standing. Can can I mention one more thing, which is my work on Milk Street or is that not allowed? No, 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 you can mention anything. I was just going to, my, my last question is, what didn't I ask you that I shouldn't have? We talked about it earlier, but go ahead. We didn't go in depth. Fill people in. Whatever you want to say. Well, um, for three, I've known Christopher Kimball uh, for a million years. I wrote articles for the original Cooks magazine in the 80s. As a lot of people know, Chris started the Cooks empire and then parted ways and started a new company called Milk Street. Um, and I really valued what cooks did and what still does. I still get cooks because um, it's so scientifically oriented. So it's so wonderful to learn what, what, why things do what they do. But anyway, he and I have been friends forever. So when he switched gears and moved to Milk Street, he needed a new partner for the uh, call-in part of the radio podcast. And he thought back to when I'd done my stuff on the Food Network. He was a guest once. And he asked me if I'd like to be his partner. And radio was the one thing I'd never done. 
So I thought, yeah, this is going to be fun. So he wants it to be like car talk and have us argue all the time. And we managed to argue a fair amount. But I love talking to callers. I love talking to home cooks. And the people that call in to Milk Street, oh, my God, they're so sophisticated. Like, I just got a whole side of beef. You know, what do you suggest I do with the, I don't know, you know, some major cut of it? And I'd be like, whoa, this is sophisticated. So, um, yikes. Yeah. We were talking, I listened, and you two bounce off each other. He has his concept. But the one that was interesting, I think, that stumped you that I just, and him at the same time was this chef on yachts and working with the scales. And because the boat moved, what scale can yeah. I use? Yeah, no, it was crazy. I mean, I didn't, I don't spend a lot of time on boats, so I didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't really advise. And it was amazing to find that out, that there is, it's impossible because of that. Um, yeah. You know, and I, th I think Christopher said something about a, a hang hanging, hanging scale, scale that you yeah. would hang it and hold it mm -hmm. and probably get, you know, uh, a better concept right. of what was really. But... My, I think my suggestion was measure or weigh everything on land and then get on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. That works. Um, a pleasure. As always, Sarah. Same here, Dara. Thank you so much. Hopefully, I will trip over you at the fancy food show. We will not trip over you. Let's make a and date. I will get back to you on that. I don't want people infringing on my little bit of time that I'll have with you. Um, and I just want to tell people, beware of short people that carry big knives. Right. Right. I think you're I think a fellow. you carry a 10-inch knife, don't I you? I do. I do. I do. And you're also I, a short person. Right. So. I once, yeah, the husband came in one time who was 6'3", big fellow. I was mise en chopping, doing something, and he just irritated the heck out of me. And I turned around with the knife, and he looked at me, and he left. He says, I can squash you like a grape, and walked out. Whoa. He doesn't know, though. He really doesn't. No, no. But I just yeah. thought about that knife thing. Sarah, all the best wishes. Everybody, sarahmoulton.com, Milk Street, Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Look for that. Check your PBS schedules. We're saying the fall, October, September, October. Yes. Can't wait. Yes. Sarah, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Moaz. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Uh, next week's show, we're going to have Aaron Joseph, who is a mixologist. He and two other gentlemen here in Baltimore, one a mixologist. All three of them got together to delve into rum. Aaron's from Hawaii, one's from Puerto Rico, and I can't remember the other fellows from another island. But they've created the Cane Collective, and they have all these mixes, cocktail mixes, and they can also be used for seltzers. And just get the story behind that. So we hope you'll tune in next week and check out Aaron Joseph. As always, this show will be up on Jay Moore Living's Facebook page immediately, jmoreliving.com, in the next couple hours as it gets uploaded as a YouTube. You can reach me at food at jmoreliving.com. My social is at Dara Cooks. Again, feel free to go into the archives, find the past shows, and enjoy them on your walks, on your runs. Your drives, we love when you go back in and dig. The shows are a mixed bag of people internationally, nationally, and locally. So as I always end the show, may your plates always remain full. And we will see you next week.